Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Contrarian. My next guest is a professor of organic chemistry at Cornell University. He is also a common guest on many other channels similar to mine. And most importantly, he just has a lot of common sense and reason in a market which is a very void of such uh, realities today. So, uh, Dave Collum, thank you for joining me today on The Contrarian. Hey, it's my pleasure. Um, just clearing my screen of f files to save because I realized I had a bunch of stuff I'd written and not saved. Uh, thrilled yeah. to be here. Thank you. I, Dave, I just want to get started with if you had to like uh, give a few descriptive sentences or adjectives about the market these days. I mean, what? how would you describe where we are right now? Uh, nuts. Um, uh, uh, I've, I've written sections on this this year. Um, it's at all time record valuations, in my opinion, which means either you're going to get terrible returns going forward because there's no way to grow, um, uh, or you're going to get annihilated as it regresses to the mean. And so, uh, so I see about a, you know, 60, 70 percent correction uh, in the future. Um, could get worse if it decides to do damage. Um, I don't see how we get out of that, um, either through time or price or some combination of the two. Um, so I, I don't, um, I'm not very optimistic about that. Um, could be a good time to own the precious metals. They've been beaten up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of enthusiastic about uh, energy and commodity type stuff even though uh, if we have a real hard sell, everything will sell. So I, I'll get beaten up too if I do too much of that. Okay, so yeah, it sounds like, yeah, very similar to what I've seen you say in past interviews that I've seen you do. Um, I Yeah, with, with in terms of the, the crash you talked about, or I know a couple of days ago you put up a chart of the, the S&P 500 adjusted for inflation, just a historical chart mm -hmm. going back. 100 plus years or something like that. And essentially what it showed is not only are we in extremely uncharted territory in terms of valuation, and I'll probably throw this chart up on the video right now, but uh, not only that, but does it, but it takes so long in terms of getting, you know, looking at past historical times, say from the Great Depression, it took, I don't know, what, 30, 40 years to get back to that same level on the S&P? Well, it's a complicated analysis because, first of all, you have to inflation correct, which a lot of people don't. The sell side guys won't. They'll say, look, you know, our worst case scenario is, you know, 13 or 14 or 15 years to catch back up after something horrible like 1929. Um, our valuations are higher now, so something horrible like 1929 could be a quaint idea. Uh, if you inflation correct, then, then uh, you see some uh, other much more dire uh, uh, scenarios playing out. So, for example, the markets in 1906 uh, not only took a while to correct, but the, the metric I like, um, like several odd metrics. One is when someone says how a company's doing, I go, when when did they first arrive at the price we're sitting at right now? Right. So the Nikkei uh, is sitting at uh, somewhere around 29,000. Uh, it was first 29,000 around 1987. So Nikkei investors have been uh, have been getting throttled for 35 years. They call it the lo the, the, the lost decade. It's, it's an only 35 year decade I know of. Um, and, and they're still not back to even. And that's still that's not even inflation adjusted. And so um, from 1906, if you ask the question, how long did it take not only to get even, which which if inflation adjusts is a long time. Um, but when when did you last reach that price? That's the that's the metric I like. So so you can sort of recover and then bounce back down and bounce back up. And at some point, at some point, the markets finally finally break through that that old bubble high, and never to look back again, right? And and it turns out that from 1906, um, we treaded water for 75 years. Um, and you know, uh, the, I've got a chart I like to put up where there's about four or five periods in the 20th century where, where that period of water treading, where it's exactly the same price, inflation adjusted, uh, they range from 40 to 75 years long. So the average investor has not a clue that this is happening. 
has happened and likely will happen. So. Yeah, I do find it bizarre at times I get comments on my videos where I make content kind of similar to this of just saying, you know, be cautious because we're in this uncharted territory of people saying, well, you know, we've been through bear markets like in 2008 and that recovered very quickly. So why not just keep holding through it? Um, but yeah, that really is ignoring a lot of other factors that you bring up in that, you know, there are past historical periods where it's, it's taken up to 75 years to even break even. Um, so, well, there's another horror story out there. Um, in that if you look at, um, historical fair value and historical fair value depends on how you define history. Um, but when can you say a pre-1980 metric and just say, what did the markets do? How are they priced for, for a better part of a century? Um, or up even to 1990. Um, and, and then, uh, what you notice is, is that by, uh, I'd say by 20 different metrics, there's a distinct departure of the markets from fair value to the upside uh, starting around 1994. And, and uh, that just so happens to be the same year uh, that leverage within the financial system took off. And so you can actually track leverage in the system to uh, pricing relative to fair value in 1994 is this break point. So we have been largely above historical fair value for, uh, what's the math on that? That's, that's almost 30 years and uh, 25 years, we'll call it. And you say, well, then your historical fair value is a stupid number. I go, or the leverage is at stupid levels. I, I just don't know. Uh, what I do know is the markets didn't look that stupidly cheap in 94. You know, uh, they're pretty normal in 94. And so if you do get above historical fair value, though, then by definition, your returns can't be as good, right? If you overpay, if I, if I have a revenue stream and I pay twice as much for that revenue stream, I'll get half as much percent return. I, it, you can't win. Yeah. So in referring to just how much leverage has probably played into the, you know, massive run that the market has had since 94 do you think that it ever really gets back to where it was prior to that or do you think it's kind of leverage is just going to keep going on in the system or uh i don't know how leverage can just keep going on uh, I, I, I i except that there is sort of a model in my head that's that says you know markets of the past were owned by a much smaller subset of the population, right? So most people didn't have markets. They've been democratized now. And so uh, if, you, if you look at the growth in the GDP, it ought to track the markets. And that's why Buffett's favorite indicator is the market of the S&P or even the Wilshire 5000 price relative to GDP, because that, that really is telling you the market price relative to the underlying economy. And you have to ignore funny things like the GDP metrics are lousy because they use fake inflation numbers and stuff like that. But um, but but it 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 you you end up in this situation where um, if the markets have been democratized and therefore they've been essentially bid up by many many more people owning a slice of the pie, uh, they haven't increased. Uh, the size of the pie, they've simply increased the price of each slice. And so uh, so you can buy a piece of the pie and you will get less pizza for your money because the pie is the GDP. Yeah, and the Buffett indicator would be, I believe it's currently at the highest it's ever been. Um, and that does kind of beg the question of, uh, say, people like Buffett or Munger or Ray Dalio, you know, uh, what is their what could their plan or thinking be right now? Because they're not heavily in cash. I mean, they do have some pretty decently large cash positions, but they're still still in the market. I, it is a bit confusing to say, look at Buffett's um, holdings and to see even though that his favorite indicator is at all time high is that he's not necessarily, you know, selling very aggressively. He's got, a, he's got 140 billion in cash. I mean, that's that's yeah. a healthy chunk. Um, he also, so a lot of people think they're going to hide out in stocks that are fair valued. Um, I think there are 
uh, relative bargains out there. I don't think there are, I don't think there are hardly any absolute bargains and, and they will not look like absolute bargains if we have a big, if, if we correct the market 65%, you will have a hard time finding uh, uh, an asset class that didn't get hurt. I, I just, it's not even imaginable almost to me. Uh, what you can do is get relatively less hurt. And, and if you have ridden this market up since 94 and, and then you, you sort of go to less painful assets, then you will net somehow come out ahead, relatively will come out ahead. But, but there's just periods of time we're investing is just almost impossible to be successful, and, and this this new era notion, this this uh, this post postmodernist market where you think that it, you just always make money, is just nonsense. There's a guy named Ed McQuarrie who analyzed markets over the last two hundred years, and he said that uh, that equities and bonds tie each other throughout throughout the two hundred years. With the exception of, and I always thought that ought to be true. That's why the papers he's been writing caught my attention. Uh, with the exception, he says, of post World War II US markets, where um, financial repression drove the bond market into a horrible bear market. So bond owners got killed, they got below inflation returns, and, and, and it, you know, the pain was mitigated in part by an economy that was off the charts good because, because it was a post war economy. Right, we were rebuilding the world. They were paying us to do it, and so, um, so now I think there's just periods where investing is is almost impossible to do well, or to to make a lot of money. I think uh, Buffett is is clearly stated in his '99 article that uh, any investor who thinks he can get above four percent after all the fees and everything is is nuts. Now there's not there's hardly an investor out there who thinks that's the number. Right, there's very, very few think four percent is the right number. Uh, polls show they think seventeen percent is the right number. Most people are in for a very rude awakening. Uh, seventeen. How can you possibly grow an equity market seventeen percent with a GDP growing at one and a half percent? Yeah, it's a complete separation from the underlying fundamentals in the economy. Um, yeah, yeah, and and those separations don't last. They just can't last, right? And unless I have this theory also that, that the, the, the Bitcoin and the crypto markets, which I'm really I get tired of talking about, but I think I think they kind of codified the greater fool theory into a new era digital world. And so, you know, the greater fool theory is, you know, you buy it because someone else will buy it from you for a higher price. And I think in some sense, that's what Dalio does, what Buffett does. Uh, you know, after 2000, Buffett said, you know, I really regret not selling off some of my equities that I knew were overpriced and somehow it just didn't register to him either that he would get beaten up. Um, everyone thinks they're going to get out. They think they're smart. It's not possible for everyone to get out. Someone's got to own them. But, um, but I think the crypto markets, because they're pure price, right? So, and I'm not picking on crypto guys. It, Crypto's pure price, right? There's no revenue stream. There's no asset. There's nothing behind it. It's just the price of the crypto and, and the, the miracles of the blockchain, whatever that is. Um, I think investors watch the crypto guys get, get fabulously wealthy and somehow uh, converted that into the mindset of the greater fool theory where you say you get fabulously wealthy by simply buying something that goes up in price. And so we've lost all sense of fundamental analysis. We've lost all sense of underlying revenue streams. And it's just about price. And it's, that's, not, that's never been true. Maybe it is now. But, it, you know, 5,000 years of capitalism, that's not been true. Yeah, I was going to ask you regarding crypto and NFTs, specifically with just how massive the market of these tokens, I'll call them, because they're not really assets, but how large it's become. It's something like two trillion or more now. And I'm just wondering, say that some sort of uh, deleveraging event were to occur, say that the majority of these cryptos were to go to basically being worthless, could that have the effect of trickling down through these other institutions and just almost escalating the whole situation, making it a lot worse? Um, well, I don't know for sure. Um, 
let's separate cryptos and NFTs. I think cryptos uh, get sort of a maybe question mark in my skull and NFTs look insane. So I hate to group those two together. Um, but um, so, so I think if there's people who, uh, if there's people who perceive they own $2 trillion, forget about who that is. There's a perception of $2 trillion of worth, which, which alters your thinking. So if I perceive I'm worth 10 million, when I'm not, I will act in a way that at some point will cause me to suffer down the road. I'll buy a big house that I turns out I couldn't afford. Uh, if I liquidate the crypto and I get the house, then I got out early and I'm fine. But but if I'm sitting on crypto and living a lifestyle that's that's proportionate to my perceived wealth, and then the perceived wealth vaporizes, I just became an extremely fragile consumer. And it might entail having to sell houses off. It might entail having to, your hedge funds who have them might be liquidating their assets because their their 220 model falls apart. Um, the crypto world, the one thing they seem to be infatuated with is the idea that bigger and bigger players are getting into the game. Uh, I view those big players as very weak hands. Um, I don't think those are diehard libertarian crypto holding till I die people. That those are guys like Stevie Cohen who will. And I don't know if he does, but I just like to use him metaphorically. Um, who will own it till it's not fun anymore? And once the cryptos either get boring, which wouldn't take much, or actually turn into a painful downhill slide, which wouldn't take much, uh, those guys are out. Those guys will not take the beating on the downside if they can help it. So there'll be a wholesale sell-off by the guys who are looking to just grab the upside. The diehards, if everyone was a diehard, then this whole model would be wrong. But I just don't think they are. I think crypto believers are people who believe in the price, not in, not in the blockchain, crypto, libertarianism, you know, sound money. That's a much smaller subset. Okay, so you would maybe say that a lot of the institutional money in crypto right now is probably more on the opportunistic bandwagon of just riding. Oh, yeah. oh okay. I think so. I think so. I think so. Even diehards like Michael Saylor, or who's built his, who's taken a wealth creating company. I'm not sure how much wealth they created, but he had a wealth creating company. This turned it into a crypto hedge fund. Uh, you got to figure Saylor at some point is going to want to try to save his bacon to the yeah. downside, even though he, he professes to be a true diehard, a true believer, laser-eyed crazy, right? I, who, who wants to write it down, right? No one wants yeah. to write it down. So I gotta figure, I, I gotta figure there's some come to, and there's people who say, look, I wrote it down 80%, now I'm up and I'm great, right? But, but, but sell-offs can, 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 you know, can leave a lot of dead bodies. I'm reading a book on the Comanches right now and it, it's, could be from similar to some of those Comanche raids. Okay. Yeah, maybe can shift a little bit more towards uh, the Federal Reserve and I guess a little bit of the recent actions that they've taken of the tapering. And do you think they have a plan at this point of what just because they're, they're really trapped right now in terms of where, where they are, but do you, do you think they have a plan or are they just, um, you know, going and they have a prayer. <laughs> okay. They have a prayer. I, I, you know, somewhere, somewhere the Federal Reserve is somewhere between guys who are so arrogant they don't realize they're in trouble, the guys who are so terrified they don't know what to do. And I don't know where they fall in there. They certainly are in a terrible, terrible position. As Kevin Warsh, former Fed head, said, uh, said it, it, we would be better off if they hadn't treated the last decade like every day was an emergency. If they had somehow been able to regroup and get control of the system when it was not in a crisis, they'd use non-crisis periods. And they just didn't want they didn't want the markets to not only not be in a crisis, but they they just I think they view their job as to bail out pension funds, which are probably still underwater but closer to being okay. Uh, my, my guess is they're playing some long game where they think if they can just keep assets going up, you know, Illinois will not be insolvent. California will not be insolvent. And, you know, various municipalities will not be. I, and it doesn't work that way because wealth is not price. 
Yeah, okay. So I guess another question regarding the Federal Reserve. Do you think that uh, they're almost playing dumb in terms of not acknowledging inflation and continuing to go on the transitory inflation argument? Do you think that they are trying to keep that going as long as they can um, simply because they would they would like inflation to to be going higher in the with the with regards to where the the debt is the national debt and maybe they're thinking that you know with inflation going a lot hotter maybe they can inflate away the debt in some way do you think that's at all playing into well, which is going up faster the debt or, infl or the prices the debt um, the debt would be <laughs> right now yes by a, by a healthy margins so yeah. the rhetorical question I like to ask is if the plan is to inflate away the debt by definition, the inflation has to be at a stiffer pace than the debt yeah. growth. And and we're not, you know, what did 2020 usher in, right? 2020, 2021, vast, vast amounts of debt, like 35% per annum debt growth. I don't, I could be off by 10% on that, but it's a, it's, and I could be off, maybe inflation is that bad, right? But the CPI inflation, as reported, is not. I mean, when labor goes up threefold and cars are going up as fast as they are, you got to wonder how a 7 or 8% inflation rate is remotely correct. Right? I can't name anything that's not gone up more than, than, than inflation. Uh, than the reported inflation. Everything I buy, you know, whether it's beef, it's about 50%, you know, everything's up. So so the, the CPI numbers might be complete and utter fiction. And they've always seemed fictional to me, but but I think it's a new art form at this point. So so maybe they are inflating away the debt, but <laughs> the, the debt's growing at, at at unbelievable paces. Right? It's up sixfold yeah. since 2000. Sixfold. Oh yeah, I mean, and since in the last two years, it's just exploded. So if they are and trying so, to inf inflate away the debt, they would really have to get inflation going to a whole. Well, new they're failing. Group. Yeah, another way of putting it is they're failing, right? Right now yeah. they're failing. So if they do manage to inflate away that kind of debt growth, which which I did the math, the sixfold is uh, nine to ten percent annualized growth in debt. Um, uh, to, to inflate that away uh, will be a uh, economically catastrophic inflation. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I it's it's confusing then what their plan is in the long term if they even have one, because um, of course they're they're saying that they'll they'll taper and they'll you know there won't be another recession. I think Janet Yellen said something like there won't be another recession for. 20 years or something crazy like that. But no, in her lifetime was the phrase, which whichever comes first, okay. right? I would say that might be her lifetime. Um, but she's an idiot, right? She's just, I, she, I, okay, she's either an idiot or pathological liar, I, you know, but I, she's the more benign interpretation, she's an idiot. Um, who in their right mind would say that? Yeah. Right. That, that's like saying, you know, there'll be no teenage pregnancies in the next 10 years. Right. It it's just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, historically, recessions happen a lot more frequently than 10 years. It's, you know, seven, seven years, I think, is the average. So, it, yeah. And that it, might even be distorted by recent history where they yeah. kind of duck. I like the, the recession in 2020 was only technically a recession. I hate the, I hate the, here's a stupid definition of a recession. I, I took up golf this year after 45 year hiatus. So I'm gonna use a sand trap analogy. Um, they call it a recession when you're heading down and the second you hit the bottom, you're in recovery, you're not in recession anymore. That's like being on the upslope of a sand trap. You're still in the sand trap. Yeah. So the thing that's been bugging me lately, and I actually put out a tweet today to, to get Twitter poll. I keep hearing economists say that we are in a booming economy with a tight labor market. And I would call it a pathetically bad economy with a broken labor market. Yeah, so I what think are that's... these economists talking about? I, that, that, that's a booming economy with a tight labor market seems like we're in some Goldilocks on steroids moment. Meanwhile, no one can hire. The, the store shelves are... Are Spartan, the, the, the truckers, they can't get truckers. What kind of booming economy are they talking about? 
I know. This and is I, just yeah. nuts. I keep hearing well, the it's phrase. It's just the bullshit that they do, right? It's just like, it's the crap they do. Yeah, I, they, I keep. They say stuff yeah. like this. Sorry, I, I keep hearing the phrase, the uh, reopening economy argument. I, I still hear that, and it's, you know, a year and a half. Garbage. After. Garbage. <laughs> Yeah. It's either garbage or I'm just dead wrong. And I, it, it could be either. I've been dead wrong before, but it, it's uh, nothing about this. Again. I did a tweet this morning where I said, uh, do, are you or do you have a family member? I, I love polls. Uh, are you or do you have a family member not working when you were working before COVID? And, and I, I did the poll and, and it was about something like 15% said yes. And I asked them to elaborate why. And uh, the circumstances. Now, it was a real interesting read. There were people saying, I didn't want to get jabbed. I got fired. There were people saying, um, you know, I got tired of the baloney. I retired. Um, there are people saying uh, all sorts of things. I became a stay at home mom because my job sucked. But, but th there was just a tremendous amount of malaise. There was no, that one person said, Oh, I'm rich on crypto. But most yeah. of it was some variant of this sucks and I quit. And it was quite a few answers. So uh, that's not a booming economy. And, and yeah. I, the, the truck driver shortage and the worker shortage, you know, Dunkin' Donuts can't get someone at 16 an hour. That's like walking out in the woods and noticing there are no squirrels and birds and going, where are the damn squirrels and birds? They're not here. I'm not hearing them. I'm not, the, 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 the sounds of silence, Simon Garfunkel, where are all the critters? And the, the question I ask is, where are all the workers? Which is why I asked that question. And it, it just doesn't make sense. I talked to a truck driver. He said a lot of them retired. He described the horror story. So when you drive a truck, you do often paid by the job. So you're sitting getting your truck loaded. You don't want to be sitting there tapping your foot because time is money for you because you're going to get paid some number of dollars for that job. He said, now you pull up to some port and you're sitting there for three days. He said, that's broken. And he said, truck drivers have all quit. They can't do that. So okay. that's where we're at. That's, where, that's, that's our booming economy. You yeah. economists who say that should get your PhDs taken away. Yeah, so it's clearly not a booming economy. And yet the nope. stock market's at close to all-time highs and up you know, 150% mm -hmm. from... The lows in early 2020 and they weren't yeah. cheap those were not the, the the market wasn't even cheap in 08 09 yeah and it, it definitely like, definitely was not cheap in march of 2020 oh not even close yeah. it was ridiculous it was it, it, the march 2020 so I, again a favorite question of mine is you know um when was the last correction i define a correction as a big price big asset price change to the downside and a big attitude adjustment. If you don't change the attitude, you've corrected nothing, right? If the investors are starry-eyed crazies and you clip off 20% off their portfolios and they're still starry-eyed crazies, you haven't corrected anything, right? This is like if you smack your kid and they, they don't give a damn, right? You haven't corrected their behavior, right? I, not that I smack kids, for the record. <laughs> I don't smack kids. But, but, but the correction requires an attitude adjustment. And I asked, when was the last correction? And people say, oh, 20, March 2020. I go, I, what attitude change? They go, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, 08, 09. And I go, did we really change attitudes in 08, 09? Or is the message, just hold on. Don't be stupid. Just hold on. They're still believers. You go, okay, uh, oh, oh, you know, 2000, 2003, not even close. Not even close. Uh, the Asian flu, not close. They bailed us out. 87, not close. 87 was the, the maiden voyage of the buy and hold no matter what they'll save us model. So the last correction, in my opinion, where investor attitudes were changed was from 67 to 81. And by 1981, Wall Street could not give equities away. And, and Ralph Paul did a great description of what it was like. He said, who in their right mind would buy equities? When you could get money market accounts at you know, 16%, and you know, there's just, uh, he said, you just, no one could make the case for equities, which was the bottom, which was a phenomenal. Back in 81, you could throw a dart blindfolded and, and, and you could not fail to, I think I've said that right, you could not fail 
to hit an asset class would make you money by throwing a dart because everything was cheap because inflation was about to head down, rates were about to head down, which by the way is what makes things get expensive as rates head down, assets go up. Once they're down at the bottom, assets don't go up anymore. People think low and in low interest rates are bullish. No, dropping rates are bullish. Once they're low, you hit the end of the rope. You hit the end of the chain. One of my favorite jokes, some guy squats over a bear trap and gets slammed right in the crotch. And the doc says, oh, that must hurt. And he said, well, the thing that really hurt was when I got to the end of the chain. <laughs> That's the end of the chain. Yeah, so we'd be at the opposite end of where the market was back in the early 80s. We're at the opposite right. end of... So in a way, it could almost be the case where stocks become extremely unpopular and you know, bonds, money market accounts gradually gain favor again. But that'll um, take years. Yeah. And, and I, my guess is, my guess is, there's another model I wish someone had told me when I was 25 years old, and that is the demographic model. And I think it's pretty compelling. So what was the 80 to 2000 boom or 80 to 2010 or 20 boom even? Um, it was the largest generation in history picking up steam, hitting full stride, building wealth in some sense, working hard, and a relatively small percentage of the population being the slackers, the old guys, the young guys. And, and now we got the boomers who are hitting retirement. They're going to be trying to liquidate their assets to live off of, which is going to put a selling pressure. And, uh, and, and so I think the demographics guaranteed a boom. At some level. Now we also start with super low valuations, so that did too. But now this 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 headwind. I hate to use all these metaphors. But this headwind of, of the boomers all slowly but methodically liquidating their assets. I, I have kids. I know people have kids. Those kids are not in a position to buy boomer assets. There's just not enough wealth out there in that younger generation to be the buyers. They can't even buy a house, right? Right now, consumers' new household formation is at a record low because they can't afford to buy a house. Those are not going to—they're not going to buy our houses and our and our Tesla stock and our whatever office. They can't afford it at these prices. At these prices. So, in a way, we're almost heading for not only a valuation cliff but also a demographic cliff. Is what that's you're saying. right? That's right. Okay. That's right. And, you know, you hear it chatter, but usually it, it comes off to, the, to most investors as kind of arcane gibberish. But you hear about how Japan is an aging populace. And what a lot of people don't know is that's bad news. Now, China could be a, at some point a great opportunity because China's got these sex starved young men who, who can't get married and all they can do is work. And 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 I don't know what China's overall demographics are. Maybe they're an aging population too. I, if I were to invest, one of the first things I do is find out who's got the youngest population, who on average is the youngest. And that wouldn't be the United States. It'd probably be India or some Southeast Asian I, stock market. It's been market. a while since I looked, right? Yeah. It's been a while since I looked. I wouldn't invest in Australia right now for a totally different reason. Yeah. <laughs> Um, inflation or, or deflation? I know that kind of touched on inflation already, but um, when when this correction does occur, assuming it, it does at some point, do um, you think that would be a very deflationary type event? Or? Um, I kind of hate the waffling of first one, then the other. Or it's yeah. coming, but not yet, because then when it finally comes, you say, see, I said not yet. And unless it came tomorrow, then you yeah. get to say, see, I didn't, I didn't say right now. Um, I have this feeling, and I can't really justify it, but I have this feeling that deflation is the only way to really get rid of debt. And there's very few instances, I think the U.S. in the post-war period inflated away debt, while also grinding very hard on the economy. 
And so I think the combination of the two did it. But um, the British in the mid 19th century sort of ground off some serious debt from all, all sorts of wars of conquest. And but but for the most part, um, I think I think defaulting on debt, which euphemistically is a debt you believe, but you know someone got screwed. Um, Maybe the only way to do it, because I think the you know creation of inflation creates more debt, and you just never seem to get get out from behind the eight ball, as we say. So I, I could imagine us eventually having a deflationary period that finally, once and for all, does us in. Um, I certainly have no trouble spotting the current inflationary environment, and have been writing about it for the last week, and. Um, and uh, but don't forget when consumers have to pay more for food and my taxes supposedly are going to go up. Uh, I'm told by the guy who actually helped set them, and it's not public knowledge, but I've heard they're going to go up something four percent very soon, and then they're projecting eight or nine the next assessment. And um, if let's say hypothetically the price of stuff has to go up 10 percent, you say, Well, you cut back by 10 percent. Now, I've been involved in budgetary processes. And what you immediately discover when you do that is, is that, that there are fixed costs you can't cut. So uh, I can't cut 10% from my real estate taxes. I can't cut 10% from a number of things, which I have to do. So what that does is it means that the overall 10% cut in your spending has to come like as 20 or 25% from, from, from discretionary spending. And that becomes pretty depressing. And if the price of, of labor chases it up because people get mad, unionization picks up, then profit margins at companies will get crushed, right? We're, we're really cornered here, no matter how. And any scenario you give me, I can tell you why you'll get crushed with that scenario. It's, it's, it's easy because everything's overvalued. We have inflation and we're growing debt. It's just, it's, there's just, there's just an awful story. Yeah, it's a perfect storm in a way for yeah. for something like another depression occurring almost. I hate to say that word, but it um, it does bring well, to they, mind. Well, they won't call it that. They'll come up with a new euphemism. The Great Depression <laughs> was was a euphemism. they will come yeah. up with a new one, right? Great GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, right? The Great yeah. Recession. Let's call it the Great Banana. The Great Banana upcoming. Okay. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I was wondering. You've you've been in the market a lot longer than me. Um, just right now, the mainstream media, in terms of how they talk about the market, they're obviously lying significantly. Um, just when when did you notice that beginning? When did the media start pumping the markets? Um. Well, probably always. Um, I think when. Um, when a place like CNBC, which one could argue is just in response to demographics, went live and people could watch the markets and became a, a sport. And so I think in the past, when people's pensions depended on some guy in some major corporation investing the money and they just said, uh, look, you're getting a defined amount of pension, you're getting a 60% of your final pay, no one cared about the markets, so there's no reason to hype the markets. You're not going to take some some head of a defined pension plan that's worth you know 100 billion dollars. You're not going to you're going to hype the markets to that guy. He's going to know better. And so so it's really the retail entry of the retail crowd with their 401ks, right? Um, that has created the um, the pump and dump scheme that we're now witnessing. And uh, the democratization of the markets, but that's definitely limited in how far it can go. And I would, you know, just seeing a lot of other people my age, you know, in their twenties, the number of people who in the last year have started trading money on Robinhood mm -hmm. or Coinbase, it's definitely mm -hmm. almost, I would say, at the maximum it could be in terms of, you know, as many people as possible participating in this pump. Well, the grizzled old veterans, if they if they said, "Look, put together, let's put together a list of twenty indicators of a mania," you'd be checking almost every box. The one thing about this market that makes no sense to me, and I've been saying this for years, is that unlike every other mania, 
um, this one has no story. This one, this one, you know, the dot com was a great story. The the 1929 was an unbelievable story. I was around for the Nikkei when the Japanese were going to take over the world and buy up everyone's land, and we were sending executives to Japan to study how the Japanese were doing it. And it was just a credit bubble, right? It was just, but we we bought it because it was a good story. And South Seas bubble, oh my God, the new world and riches and just give us your money. It's basically a SPAC. Um, and and so now the current bubble, uh, you can't make an argument of a brave new world unless you want to go all Kathy Wood and say that somehow Facebook is wealth creation, which I don't think it is. I think it's wealth destruction. Um, I, I've made the argument that Amazon is just a, a new era version of the Sears Roebuck catalog, and it's faster and it's bigger, but it's it's not it's not more innovative, in my opinion. When you were out on the prairie in the the Sears Roebuck catalog, you could order stuff and have it delivered instead of going to the country store and getting out of barrels. And, you know, there's nothing, you know, we created trains in the oil industry and in the steel industry and in the aluminum industry. Uh, somehow the modern day industries that create dating apps just don't seem to compare. And Google, Google's an amazing technology. I get that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of with it. And Amazon is an amazing company, although it's not as innovative as people think. And Tesla looks like a scam to me. I mean, just I, it just I just don't buy it at all. Um, and and it's it's run by a guy who looks like a scamster, right? I mean, he, he sure as hell has every last shred of what P.T. Barnum seems to have had, right? He's a carnival barker. So that's going to be a funny story when it finally blows up and. and grandchildren are going to be saying, could you explain to me how you bought into that Elon Musk guy, right? He kept doing all these weird things. He's getting stoned and buying Bitcoin to pump his earnings. And he was getting freebies from the federal government, and carbon credits, and then liquidating them to pretend like he's earning money and making cars that self-ignite and fry people to death that they're, they're just, they stop in the middle of the road and you can't get them started because of some, 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 some computer chip shut them down. I, there's just the guy might be a genius, but um, uh, many of the frauds in history were geniuses. Yeah, I, I was going to actually ask you about Tesla and Musk because I almost, in terms of, I'm not an expert. I'm just yeah. watching the fanaticism and going. I, you don't have to be an expert to know that this level of crazy. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what my question was going to go along with is how how did a car company that sells i don't know one or two percent of vehicles actually become valued at more than all other vehicle companies combined i mean that's just to that's where now it's mania. over it's over a trillion dollar market cap i mean it's probably the largest so let's say let's say over the next 20 years um they they're selling 50% of the cars, they're still just a car company. So if somehow they go from one or two percent to fifty percent. So they 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 increase their market share twenty five fold. They are now fair value. That's the math I did on eBay in the late nineties, where I said that if they grow their earnings twenty percent a year for twelve years, they'll be credibly valued. And I said, that's a bad bat. It's a bad bat. And yet a lot of hedge funds and pension funds and institutional investors seem to somehow be justifying, you know, the valuation Tesla's at right now. What's a reach for and yield? Right? If if your pension fund has as its assumption seven percent return. Right, so you're running CalPERS or something. You somehow have to get a 7% return or you're insolvent, right? Because that's contractually, I don't quite know how CalPERS works, but there's certainly some who said, look, either we get 7% or the people who think they're going to get 7% aren't going to get 7%, right? It's just that simple. Um, fixed income is now giving you negative returns. So in a 60-40 portfolio, 40% weighting, negative returns, that means uh, that means the 60%'s got to make uh, you know 12%. Yeah, so even more. Number. 
Yeah. And you can't make 12% in general because the economy only grows 3%. And you can't make 12% from these valuations because it'll take, it'll take a decade of negative 6% to grind it down to a fair value that they might, then, might then return 7%. You know, it's, it's like speculating buying Toyota Camrys for 150000 a piece and thinking somehow you're going to sell them for 170000 next year. I, I don't see yeah. any difference. I don't see so, any difference. So, again, you would say just opportunistic jumping on the bandwagon and trying to get as much yield out of, out of Tesla as, as they can. And, guys, Kathy Wood will be on a milk carton when this is over. <laughs> Kathy Wood will be on a milk carton. Elon Musk will have his assets auctioned off in the courthouse steps. These are these are metaphors, not really predictions. But uh, um, yeah, I, this this new era. Do you, you, you know a guy named Jeff Rona, who I'm told is a good guy, or uh, some guy named Clark something? I can't remember. These were the dot com gods. Jack Grubman. They're all okay. footnotes now. <laughs> They're all footnotes. Yeah. They were the stars. Of of the last bubble, the 07 bubble is an interesting one because it really wasn't an equity bubble. I mean, it was, but it wasn't super bubble. It really was the real estate bubble. Uh, and you know, 2000 was an equity bubble, but it was localized. But it did a lot of damage when it burst. Um, this bubble is across all deciles of valuation. This is the scary part. If you look at the bottom decile valuation, the cheapos, by any metric you want, PE, whatever, you look at the cheapest ox, they're twice the historic norm too. So if we get back to a single digit PE ratio, then half the stocks are, are lower. And so if you buy a stock now saying it's cheap, like I bought some Rio Tinto. I like Rio Tinto. It pays about a 5% dividend um, as a P of around 10. But if its P goes to 5, without a change in the economy, that means I lost half my capital, right? The, the capital gains got, got nuked. Uh, Michael Berry, someone dug up some notes from him from 20 years ago this year. It was very entertaining. He was posting on some prototype chat board. And he said the default setting for him in buying buying an asset is that in the worst case scenario, you just hang on to it. So the question I have, I like to ask this question. So Netflix loses money, right? Um, they made money last year because they created no content. And they yeah. were just sat home watching Netflix. And so, okay, so they got a year of, of profits because there was essentially no, no the, the, their, their revenues were their earnings at some level. But they, they were losing money up until last year. And, uh, and it, was, it was a grinding amount of debt they were picking up to lose money. So Netflix is now priced, I can't remember, $100 billion? I don't know what it is, some big number. And I asked rhetorically, so let's imagine Netflix lost 99%. Now it would be a super, super, super lower priced company that still loses money. Yeah. How do you price how do you price that thing? I don't know. Still not a good investment. They don't have assets. It's not like buying Exxon where you go, well, we've got all these oil reserves or you know, factories or smokestacks or book value loses its meaning with something like Netflix. We've got a couple of headquarters, some servers. Right. Yeah, that's about it. I mean, in terms of real tangible assets, right. it's all it's all digitized in terms of Netflix and, and a lot of other companies. Mm -hmm. And so, when is Netflix going to get superseded by some other company that first comes up with something that's either just much better? By the way, uh, Netflix sucks, in my opinion. I started last year trying to find something on Netflix and I, I couldn't find anything I wanted to watch. Maybe I'm confusing it with Hulu. That's how important it was to me. <laughs> okay. But but it's like a poor man's HBO. Yeah. How is that worth a hundred billion dollars? It's a lot of HBO. 
It is a lot. Microsoft, yeah. Microsoft has done well. And you go, well, that's kind of a smokestack company, digitally speaking, right? They, they're everywhere. They're, they, they're up sixfold with a growth in revenue. So something like, I don't know, 30 or 40%. So the whole yeah. thing is expansion of valuation. Yeah, PE multiple expansion at the at this point is right. what, what is mainly driving this. Right. And the PEs are calculated terribly. You want to, here's what here's a great story. This is from a year or two ago. Um, uh, Horizon Kinetics did an analysis of the PE ratio. So if you look up something like the triple Q or you look up the Russell 2000, they both suffer the same problem, it turns out. Uh, I think it's the triple Q, though, which Horizon laid it out carefully, where they said, look, when they calculate the PE ratio, and it's in their prospectus, the triple Q, any company that doesn't earn money, they give a PE ratio of 40. Any company with a ratio over 40, they give a PE ratio of 40. And then huh. they average the PE ratios, and that's how they get it. Horizon Connects did a much simpler approach. They said, look, let's take all the earnings. And let's take the entire market cap and let's just look at the PE ratio. And John Crudell did this for the Russell 2000. They come out to around 100. So people think they're buying triple Qs cheaply because it's a sort of a, a 4%, a 25-year duration, they call it, a, sort of a 4% return off their PE of 25. Um, don't realize that buying something that has a 1% return inherent to it. Yeah, it's just it's it's uh, J Jim Chanos called it the era of fraud. That's what it is. It's the era of fraud. Yeah, if if that is in fact how they're calculating with all of these PE ratio multiples out there, um, then that is definitely extreme. I mean, even more overvalued than what we were previously talking about. I mean, right. that's a whole new first level of right. uh, overvaluation. Fraud. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, it said, I, here's what I'd like. If someone's listening to this and they can send this to me, please do it. My email. 20% um, of the S&P 500 companies are said to be zombies, which is said to be a company that cannot pay its, the interest on its loans from its cash flow. Now, 20% of the S&P 500, we're not talking about the Russell 2000, we're talking yeah. the S&P 500. And we're talking interest rates at 5,000 year lows. Now, it turns out if you go back to, I think it's 92-ish, I can't remember these numbers now, brain's getting brittle, you go back into the 90s, the number of zombies was 2% with interest rates, you know, crowding 10. So that's a fundamental sea change right there. And yeah. what I'd like to know is which of the company where's a list of the zombies there's a hundred s p now you say well then how do you know it's true and i'll tell you how i know it's true jim grant told me it was true and i'm willing to take jim grant at face value but i'd like to see a list of the companies that are listed by company name as zombies because you can't find which I don't know how to are, find them. Yeah. If I knew how to read balance sheets and stuff, I could dredge through the 500 companies and there's no chance I'm doing that. Someone who's claiming 20% are zombies, somewhere, somehow out there, someone did that. And I'd like to see the list. That would be interesting to see. I, yeah, I'd, I'd just be curious to see which, which of those it is. Is it all the bottom, you know? In terms of market Doesn't cap, matter. or is it S spread out? S&P 500 is the <laughs> S&P 500. These are not yeah. the teeny weeny little companies of the world, right? Yeah. There's the other thing that people say is the, uh, is the market cap to GDP is a flawed indicator now because the, the U.S. companies are, uh, are more global. But it turns out that if, if you do the same analysis on global GDP, you get the same answer. So that turns out to fall apart. So uh, we just have a terrible situation here. And we've got, we've got a bunch of authorities who are doing what they could call noble lies, which is when, you know, you, you lie to someone for a good cause. You know, like if your kid asks about sex, you, they're five years old, you, you give them some story about a stork because yeah. they're not ready for the ew moment. Um, 
but but a noble lie turns into bald faced lies pretty fast. And so I think people who are noble lying should think twice about noble lying to adults. And uh, and I'm not a big fan of noble lies, so which includes guys like Fauci. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you briefly about. I know that uh, this will be posted on YouTube, so I have to word this in a specific way. But carefully, does, does, yes, very carefully. <laughs> does does it alarm you of the? push of the mainstream media of celebrities social media of everybody mm -hmm. to get the jab does that concern you my theme of the year last year i finished i, I write an annual review the last year i finished with a concern about about sort of the digital world and what where it was taking us and it was a more passive view of the world where it's like what they're paying attention to, what they're learning about us and our sort of forfeiting of privacy and things like that. It has exploded into the, what are they going to do to us? And so it's explode. I believe that we are, we may even be on an inexorable march towards a global authoritarianism. I'm that dark now. And, and, and as you watch the the V word getting pushed, you can feel the authoritarianism. You can feel the fact that people who are fully already dealt with were totally circling. They've already been exposed to this nasty pathogen. Who are being told, "I don't care. You still have to get jab." That's not about healthcare. And when when they say a week after the launching of the campaign to get us all healthy again, right? They start telling pregnant women to join the party. And I'm thinking, we haven't done that since thalidomide. We've never, ever told pregnant women to do experimental treatments of any kind, including even just new drugs that do fairly generic things. You find out that pregnant women are okay with some new treatment, some new drug, when A, you have to, or B, they get pregnant and they get the drug and the things happen by mistake and you sit there and you go, and you go ah, the kid came out okay, fantastic, right? You do not do clinical trials on soccer moms who are pregnant. That's never done never will be done except this year that's exactly what we're doing and so when they stepped over that dotted line and and they pushed they three-letter agency pushed jabbing soccer moms who are pregnant with no data by the way the ones who got the first wave remember launched in december of 2020 the ones who got the first wave and happened to get knocked up simultaneously. This is a dangerous situation. You got these biomolecules swimming around in your uterus while you've got a little glob of cells growing in your uterus. This is not a pretty picture. Now, it could be okay, right? We might discover it's not a problem. But it should creep the heck out of people. Those women have just started delivering. So I'm presuming I would have heard about kids with flippers and four eyes in their forehead and stuff like that. But I would not yet have heard about kids whose IQs have dropped 30 points. I would not have heard about kids who all of a sudden have autoimmune problems because something's wrong. And 10 years from now, we finally realize that we have, excuse the phrase, a rash of problems. There's a rash on my arm right at my elbow joint, I've gotten vaccinated. And it was months ago, but I'm looking at a rash going, it's a weird rash. Why? And you can say, oh, that's just nuts to, to worry about that. But I'm going, but, but we don't know. And yeah. the problem we have is we have a crisis of authority, and it's a double entendre in the sense that we have a crisis of authority where authorities are acting like authoritarians. That's the first crisis. And the second crisis of, of authority is we don't have anyone we can turn to for the answers. We aren't basically posting YouTube on Rumble and BitChute and avoiding YouTube, like getting kicked off YouTube, like you and I are trying to do right now. Yeah. 
<laughs> we're trying to keep you from getting, you know, and there's, there's anti V guys who every time they want to say it, they do this, they point to their shoulders and uh, we just don't know the outcome. And we've got, you know, a, a rash of myocarditis and um, I'm told there are now over a hundred professional athletes who died of heart failure. Just recent, just recently too, not, yeah. yeah, this is not from the beginning of professional athletics. Yeah. And, uh, and I've been tempted to reach out to coaches and say, coaches who specifically coach athletes who measure their times to the hundredth of a second and say, are your athletes' times lagging? On the notion that it's conceivable that we've all been damaged at some low level, when my group got the V, um, they were all flat in the next day. The labs were empty. They all went together. They were empty, and you got other wusses. Well, one of them was a Division three athlete, a swimmer. He said he laid in bed and he couldn't move. And I go, how close is that to damage? Yeah, they say I mean, it's temporary, but how do yeah. we know there's not micro, you name it, it's in the lungs, micro, you name it, it's in the skull? How do we know, you know, how do we know, like I have aches and pains, but I'm, I'm not a good control experiment. How do we know that, uh, that there aren't people saying, you know, God damn it, I just seem to get winded. So I went out on Twitter and did a poll and say, have you noticed any, any symptoms that you would otherwise totally ignore? But, but maybe as you think about it, maybe you say, wow, I do notice I've had the sniffles for quite a while, or I do notice that I've, I've, really i find the stairs a little painful to do you know things like that things that 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 for which there's no control experiment um but but 100 athletes dying of of heart problems and now norway and sweden and several other countries are are pulling the v from from the 30 and under group okay so if 30 and unders are at risk are 31 year olds okay? <laughs> right? 32 yeah. year olds? Uh, you know, what, what's going on here? I, I, you know, if, if, what age do you become okay? And I think it might be, well, we've already nuked them. We haven't nuked these guys. Um, read about Moderna. Your viewers should go fish out Moderna stories from 2017 and 18. What you will find are Wall Street analyses that keep uh, hammering the Moderna team, say their product has shown no efficacy, that their move into vaccinations is stupid. You'll find that they moved into vaccinations, this is pre-COVID, because their lipo, uh, lipo nanoparticle technology is too toxic to do multiple jabs. You'll find that there's analogies drawn between Moderna and Theranos. You'll find the CEO is considered to be a shyster of a higher order. And this is the company that we called upon to save the world. This is staggering. I yeah. stumbled upon these stories. Yeah, and you're not, you're not necessarily going out there with you know 40 hours a week researching this you're just kind of doing this on your free time winging it yeah and by the way just for the audience the only reason why i'm asking dave about this is he's a scientist at cornell um right. and so you you've also posted some interesting data regarding climate change on twitter yeah um maybe you could talk about this as well i know that just because i mentioned that word now I mean, I have a label under my video on YouTube, but um, yeah, maybe oh, you call could. call it the C word. The C word. <laughs> um, four years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have said, sure, it's real, because I'd asked many scientists. I'm not qualified to know. I'm, I'm, one thing I knew is, one time I said to the Secretary of Energy, I'm agnostic, and he, he flinched. And, and I said, well, you know, it would take me 10,000 hours to become credibly knowledgeable about climate change to have a well-formed opinion it's just a very complex problem and i said what i'll tell you is every scientist i've ever asked says it's real 
right? And so it followed the science, which used to be fine until 2020. And now it's become like this meme, right? Yeah. Follow the science. <laughs> it's a meme because the scientists are lying left and right. Um, so then I started getting poked by my brother and some doctor started emailing me and they were saying, how do you know? And I, I go, I, I've got emails that say, look, I, every scientist I know, I've got an email trail showing my view on this. And then I finally said to one of them, I said, uh, there's no prominent scientists who don't buy this. And he said, oh yeah, sure there are. So I said, send me some names. And he sent me a list of names. I expect him to be Sheboygan State College, you know, who cares? I, not to offend Sheboygan State College, but you know, you get my point. Um, and they were not. They were prominent scientists at prominent institutions, Stanford, Harvard, Caltech, you name it, Berkeley. And I go, okay, but these guys aren't, they're not, <clears throat> they're not denying climate change. What they probably did is shot down a model. And that's being construed by a bunch of whack jobs as evidence that climate change isn't real. Whereas it's a normal, healthy part of science. So I start Googling them and that's not what I found. I found world famous scientists over and over and over who said, this is a load of garbage. The former head of the National Academy of Sciences at MIT, the former advisor to uh, 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 several presidents, scientific advisor, a prince named William Happer, Freeman Dyson, the legendary physicist who served on the American Physical Society's committee to look into climate change. Uh, Obama's chief scientific advisor, um, Steve Coonan, who kind of straddles the line because he knows if he goes full out, you know, this is garbage, he, he will be completely nuked. But he did come out and say that the models can't possibly predict the temperature based on the simplicity of the models. He said the projections just can't possibly be true. Physicists at Stanford says the models have an error bar that are five times the size of the prediction. Uh, the chairman of Hebrew University's physics department, a solar physicist, says there's not a shred of evidence that CO2 is causing any of the change in temperature. Nobel Prize winner in Europe, can't remember his name said he got asked to serve on a panel. He said he didn't really know anything about it. And so he started digging. He said it took him about 20 hours to figure out that the science was garbage. Hmm. So what's going on here? Well, we're in an age of narratives. And the narratives are about controlling behavior, whether it's what health care you're supposed to get this year, whether it's about a laptop being real or fake, whether it's about the elections being real or fake, whether it's about uh, whether it's about you know some some you know Mar uh, 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 Andrew Cuomo, a everything is a narrative. Everything is controlling the media. And climate change. Here's what I'll tell you. And they always say, "Oh, it's big oil bribing these deniers." Big. There's I haven't found a shred of evidence of big oil bribing anyone. I've been looking for it. Once in a while, they put some money into a think tank that invites in a speaker, right? That's about it. But the climate industrial complex is over a trillion a year and is projected going forward to be $150 trillion. Now, please explain to me who on the receiving end of $150 trillion is going to say it's baloney. And the scientists are not going to, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're a climate scientist, and you write a proposal, and you every proposal has an important problem, background information about what you've done to make some progress, what you're going to do, and why what you're going to do is important, and a budget page that says, here's why we need a lot of money. That's every proposal. If you come out and say the problem's not important, you're done. I've asked colleagues who believe in climate change, if you submitted a proposal, it looked like it was going to show climate change is not real. Would you ever get funded? They say, not a chance. So the bottom line is the scientific community through an extraordinary Darwinian selection has only funded believers or those willing to profess to believe. So I dug into it and dug into it and I found that every story within the climate change model was nuanced. You know, in the middle of a podcast when I'm thinking about the polar bears, right? The polar bear, that starving polar bear. It's, it's a meme. And I realized a polar bear is within three months of the end of its life. It's going to look that way. It's going to look bad. 
He could have stomach cancer for all I know. And then I find out that the polar bear population has tripled since 1970s. Yeah. Then you find out the ocean acidification story fell apart this year. They're not able to replicate the data. I think some of the scientists are trying to get it right. I think many are actually, but they're keeping their mouth shut. Um, the Arctic, the, the glaciers are receding, those pictures of before and after, right? You go, oh my God, how can that not be climate change? You go, well, underneath those receding glaciers, they're finding 1,200 year old trees, which means they grew there 1,200 years ago, which means it was warmer 1,200 years ago. Yeah. And they're finding that that um, they're worried about, you know, plague infested carcasses being dug up from the frozen tundra, which means at one point it wasn't frozen, right? Uh, they're finding that while the ice sheets in one place are dropping, ice sheets in other places are growing and the net change is not there. I've got headlines saying, how is the net change in the ice going up with climate change being so bad? I'm going, well, maybe you ought to Check your assumptions. And it just is over now. The hockey stick, the famous Al Gore hockey stick, turns out to be the centerpiece of what's called Climate Gate, where they fake the damn thing. Do you see any scientists not invoking the hockey stick? No, they still use it. The, the hockey stick got taken to court because one of the climate scientists criticized Michael Mann. He was a detractor, so Michael Mann sued him for defamation. And after eight years, the judge ruled, you have provided no evidence that your model is valid. And therefore, not only do you not get your def defamation case, you have to pay all the legal fees. Michael Mann lost in court on the hockey stick. And the, the, the cancellation in the climate world is horrific. You get out of line, you're done. You're not just not funded, you're done. So when Steve Coonan wrote his book this year, Caltech physicist, Caltech modeler, presidential science advisor, and chair of the American Physical Society's Climate Change Committee to look into it, chair, he writes a book and calls this stuff out. Nothing. Crickets this year. He gets a couple of interviews. Nothing. Because there's $150 trillion. You have central bankers saying they're ready for climate change. Central bankers have nothing to do with climate change. They change monetary policy on month by month basis. And climate change is over centuries. These guys are lying. Now, lying central bankers are a dime a dozen. So, so you should check your climate change model, your thinking. I guarantee you, I can at least hold my own in a, in a, in a debate. I guarantee, I gave a talk in New Orleans this, about a month ago, and I, I, I smacked the climate change model for about 20 minutes. And it wasn't hard, it just wasn't hard. And, uh, and one guy challenged me, and then and he said, I think it's real. And it turns out a friend of his said, you know about A, B, C, and D, and you didn't know about any of them. So it was clearly from a position of profound ignorance. Yeah, so, so dig into climate, dig in, yeah. find out, in my opinion, it's crap. I could, I'm well aware I could be wrong, but they've lost me. My faith is gone. I'm not a believer anymore. It took four years. I do realize that we are running low on time, Dave. I really appreciate you making no the problem. time for talking with me today. Um, maybe you can just let my viewers know where they can find you. Um, I know it's interesting to follow you on Twitter, so I definitely follow you on Twitter, but maybe let the viewers know where they can, can find you if they want to yeah, hear more of what you have to say. Um, well, Twitter's David B. Column. Um, I do accept the emails. I try to answer them. Um, if, if, if I'm in the Department of Chemistry at Cornell. Uh, a very low barrier, I said, is, is that you can find my email. If you're not smart enough to find my email, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> because you're one dumb person. Um, otherwise, you should be able to. Um, and, uh, and I write an annual review. I'm, I'm a blogger with the most bizarre tactic. I write a single blog a year. It's way too long. Um, the climate change write-up was in 2019. So if you want to read about it, search, uh, search uh, David, B. Col David Column, Year in Review. Put in any calendar year you want, you'll get that calendar year's year in review. 2019 was the climate change, the big climate change write-up, which I stand by. 
once in a while I write something and I have to say, do I still stand by it? I still stand by it. Um, same year I talked about Epstein. Very funny story. The Epstein story is hysterically funny. There's stuff people don't know about the Epstein story. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll talk about anything. I'll talk about whatever crosses my path if it looks like a good story. Okay. So. Well, there you have it. Dave Collum, thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure.